Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We are all together in this virtual setting, which we unfortunately become used to, to discuss the future of research for development, and more specifically, the need to build resilient food, land and water systems to address all forms of malnutrition and to contribute to the realization of all sustainable development goals. I'm sure you all noticed that we moved from the 20th to the 21st century, 20 years ago. It is thus time to look at addressing 21st century challenges. In the 20th century, we focused on increasing production, essentially through productivity in a world characterized by an incredible demographic explosion from 1.5 to 6 billion people. Looking at supply achievements, this has been a great success. The persisting concerns about malnutrition do not relate today to a shortage in global food production. For the last 60 years, the CGIR has provided a huge contribution and shown great records of accomplishment. Yet, all forms of malnutrition represent the number one problem of public health and addressing such concern as stated in the two will take place in a completely different context. While population will continue to increase, especially in Africa, the challenges names today are health, desertification, biodiversity, climate change, social justice, including gender issues, political stability, some of them being the consequences of deep transformation undertake, undertaken during the last centuries and related with the increasing alerts about planetary boundaries. The focus cannot exclusively be on food supply any longer. As highlighted by the Agenda 2030, these challenges are complex and highly connected among sectors else, and call for systemic transformation to take place. If a profound change in food system is required to address the SDG2, it also represents a powerful lever to achieve the whole Agenda 2030, as highlighted by the HRP. The organization of a food system summit by the United Nations organization in 2021 represents a unique opportunity for doing so. Such a perspective also calls for a deep change in the way research is performing. This is one the questions and priority it looks at. Its vision, its mission, the way it comes to research, the way it promotes partnership among scientific communities, the way it articulates itself with users of the knowledge and technology it produces. Building upon its experience, the CGIR has decided to embark on a profound reform. This is about a new portfolio to address future challenges and stimulate innovation processes. This is about governance to demonstrate as much impact as possible through the implementation of its portfolio. We want to interrogate that moment today and how CGIR can ambitions being a game changer by becoming a system thinking hero that contributes to change towards sustainability. To look at both the future of research for development and the way the CGR may contribute to build resilient food, land and water systems, we will have a fantastic panel during the next hour. Claudia Sadov will first share with us the very preliminary key features that are proposed and the next steps toward implementing the CGR reform. As the CGR special representative to the UN Food System Summit, Kanayo Nwanze will then comment about the CGR contribution to the summit. Focusing on two specific issues on which the CGR has not, Imaman Njuki and Ren Sadad will then share their provocative views and stimulate all of us. Jemima will comment about the perspective of, of gender equality and women's empowerment, 
and Lawrence about the perspective of nutrition and food systems. We will finalize, finally organize a question and answer session when you will be invited to share your thoughts on the future of CGR research. Please feel free to send your questions in advance on the chat facility. Time will be short, but we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Let's get there. Claudia is the one CGR managing director for research, delivery and impact and the executive management team convener. I invite you to look at her bio on the material prepared for the event and to realize how great is her experience in high level World Bank and CGR positions in different parts of the world. She also is a member of the science group of the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here today and to have an opportunity to speak about how we at CGR are working to sharpen our focus on delivering real solutions to the increasingly complex and interrelated challenges of food, land, and water systems. If we can put up the presentation, please. Thank you. Next slide. Before I delve into how we're changing the way we, were, we will work to meet the changing demands of the, and the evolving global context, I wanna say a few words about CGR for those of you who may not be very familiar with our work. Next slide. CGR is the world's largest global agricultural research and innovation network, bringing evidence to policymakers, innovation to partners, and new tools to harness the economic, environmental, and nutritional power of agriculture. CGR's global presence contributes an extraordinary mix of knowledge, skills, and research facilities to respond to emerging development issues. Our field-based staff possess a deep knowledge of the customs, values, and market operations in developing countries. We have an unequaled network of more than 3,000 partners from national governments, academic institutions, global policy bodies, private sector, and NGOs. A wealth of experience and knowledge spanning 50 years that builds on a track record of innovation and world-class research across food, land, and water systems. And CGR is a steward of plant genetic resources. Some 90% of all germplasm transferred under the International Treaty of Plant and Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture is distributed by CGR gene banks and breeders. Slide, please. At our 50th year, we are transitioning in a reform process to one CGR. One CGR is a dynamic reformulation of CGR's human and operational capacities, partnerships, knowledge, assets, and global presence, aiming for greater integration in the face of increasingly interrelated challenges. One CGR is based on the premise that CGR's people can deliver more relevant, consistent, and efficient outcomes if brought together with fewer institutional boundaries, by clearer, unified, and empowered management and governance. Next slide, please. Delivering as one CGR is our goal. It's our goal to become a more modern global organization and a leader in agricultural research for development with greater interactions across disciplines and regions. One CGR includes a sharper mission statement and impact focus, unified governance under a common board, institutional integration, and an enhanced country and regional presence. For our partners, CGR will be more accessible and easier to work with, both locally and globally, providing a one-stop shop to access all of our global capabilities. The One CGR Research for Development portfolio will be delivered through coordinated efforts that bring together the range of CGR capacities to a set of major ambitions for decadal transformation. Next slide. Through a consultative process, we're developing a high-level research strategy to guide our work from 2022 until 2030, aligning with global goals like the SDGs and the Paris Accords. It'll provide an overview of how CGR will deploy and develop its capacities, assets, skills, and activities to address key global and regional challenges with partners. This 2030 strategy will be delivered through three-year investment plans. 
the investment plans will provide a much greater level of detail on the objectives, targets, activities, deliverables, and budgets of CGR initiatives based on detailed co-analysis and co-design together with partners and investors. The draft strategy is now undergoing consultations and revisions and will be submitted for approval by our system council in December. The conversation we're having here today is an important opportunity for us to engage in discussion and enrich the strategy. Next slide. So what is the mission and vision of our strategy? Our unifying mission, which is uh, the result of a long consultative process, focuses on science and, and innovation to transform food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. CGR's original mission to solve hunger must now expand to address wider 21st century challenges and embrace a systems transformation approach for food, land, and water systems to deliver broad access to affordable, sufficient, healthy diets and decent employment, all within sustainable environmental limits. Under resource scarcity and global connectivity, the challenges of food, nutrition security, poverty reduction, gender equality, climate and environment are simply not separable. And our vision reflects that. Next slide. Central to the new strategy is the CGR's work with um, is that CGR's work will explicitly target multiple benefits across five impact areas: nutrition, health, and food security, poverty reduction, livelihood, and jobs gender equality, youth and social inclusion, climate adaptation and greenhouse gas reduction, environmental health and biodiversity. For each of these impact areas, CGR will contribute to collective targets for transformation of food, land and water systems across local, regional and global levels. For example, we aim to help deliver affordable, healthy diets to eight and a half billion people, ending hunger and malnutrition for all and lift 500 million people above the $1.90 a day poverty line, we strive to close the gender gap in access to resources, information, and power for more than a billion women who work in food, land, and water systems, and offer decent opportunities to 200 million young people entering the job market. We also aim to turn agriculture and forest systems into a net sink for carbon to implement national adaptation plans globally and stay within planetary and regional environmental boundaries by targeting net zero deforestation and better management of water resources. Next slide. Recognizing that agricultural, environmental and social challenges and risks are interconnected, we will work across the interlinked spheres that encompass genetic resources, land and water systems, as well as food systems. CGR has a strong track record of impact through plant and animal science, particularly breeding and disease control. Now it is time for us to strive for a similar level of impact through integrated systems approaches. The pursuit of impacts across environment, livelihood, equality, nutrition, and climate collectively, rather than on separate tracks, will need to come through more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches. Next slide. We also recognize that there are many cross-cutting areas that are holding back global progress toward the SDGs. CGR will invest in particular across three of the five impact areas mentioned before, nutrition and health, gender equality, and climate. For these cross-cutting functions, we will support research, knowledge, management capacity, and policy engagement at the national, regional, and global levels. Next slide. Finally, the 2030 research strategy stakes success on doing business differently. What's new and how the CGR will work is grounded in seven key approaches. As I already mentioned, in our future research portfolio, we are embracing a systems transformation approach, seeking multiple benefits across five SDG-linked impact areas. We also aim to embed research within ambitious partnerships for change. CGR shall position research, sorry, regions, countries, and landscapes as dimensions of partnership, as dimensions of our worldview and our impact. We will generate scientific evidence on multiple transformation pathways 
These include agroecological approaches that leverage ecosystem functioning and local knowledge, technology-based approaches that optimize small-scale producers' access to and use of modern inputs, and circular economy approaches that aim to eliminate waste and keep resources in safe use. CGR targets risk management and resilience as critical qualities for food, land, and water systems. We'll seek innovative financing to leverage and deliver research through new investment and funding models. And finally, our research will make the digital revolution central to our way of working, leveraging the rapid spread of global technologies to change how agri-food system innovation is done and how it's communicated and how it's delivered. This will include partnering with, develop, uh, with cutting edge and context appropriate digital solutions like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. Overall, we feel that a unified CGR guided by the 2030 research strategy and working in collaboration with trusted partnerships on the ground is well placed to tackle the complex and interrelated challenges of the 21st century. We have all the big elements in place, our mission and vision, the SDG-led impact areas, the recognition of interrelated food, land, and water systems that lead us beyond commodity-based research to integrated approaches, and the seven key implementation approaches. Next slide. We look forward to your thoughts and stand ready to work with all partners to achieve these important and ambitious goals. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, thank you for this extremely ambitious thoughts and ideas. Uh, I, I checked in the in the chat when you were talking that people are coming from all over the world, and I all greet them from uh, from east to west, from west to east, from north to south. Well, uh, now we will listen to. Canario Nwanze, uh, among many rich experiences across the world, Canario Nwanze has served for 10 years as Director General as, at Africa Rice and was then President until 2017 of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, EFID. He has served on many executive boards, he's laureate of the inaugural 2016 Africa Food Prize. Kanayo, the UN Food System Summit in 2021 aims at unleash new actions and innovative solutions to transform food systems and deliver progress across all of the SDGs, all of them. The COVID-19 pandemic made these actions even more urgent and critical. What roles does agricultural research for development play in making research support in, in making food system more resilient, healthy, inclusive, and sustainable? And how can research support most vulnerable farmers, fishers, and livestock keepers to design and implement innovative solutions? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick. Um, for what appears to be two two questions. Um, and I, let me quickly say that listening to Claudia's presentation, uh, I would basically be addressing just a small part of what she said because her presentation basically addresses uh, these two elements or these two questions. But let me go to the first question. Um, so <laughs> in order for us to, uh, to see the, the role of agricultural research development in making our food systems more resilient, healthy, inclusive, and sustainable. And first and foremost, our solutions for food systems need to be backed by science. Agricultural science and research must be at the very heart of the response that equips the world with robust and innovative solutions for transforming our food systems to deliver healthy and improved livelihoods, and maintain a healthy, resilient, and sustainable environment and society in order to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. At CGIR, repeating what Claudia already said, the world's largest publicly funded agricultural research network, we have redirected our research to help 
enhanced food and nutrition security in the immediate COVID-19 response and recovery period, and also to help build back better in the longer term. Uh, we are building upon a 50 years track record of agricultural innovation and world-class research and impact by CGI Innovation. But CGI Innovation is estimated to have saved more than a billion lives. Uh, for those who have not uh, been able to consult, I invite you to uh, look at the uh, impact reports. Uh, second, we need a coordinated approach to tackling food insecurity through strong partnerships. We need to embrace a systems transformation approach to co-develop and deliver on innovations in technology, institutions, and policy. This includes partnering with a broad range of players, including the private sector, and to bridge the gap from innovation to uptake and accelerate sector-wide progress. And lastly, we need to mobilize much more significant resources for agricultural research. Investing in agricultural research yields very high returns. Um, spending on CGI research over the past decades resulted in a tenfold return on investment. Quickly on your second question, Patrick, on how research can help most vulnerable uh, smallholders. We have a major task of doubling the agricultural productivity and incomes of smallholders, farmers, pastoralists, and fisheries to tackle poverty and malnutrition. I believe we're all agreed on this. And I will hereby summarize very quickly two primary actions that we need to look at. Action number one, we need to pay urgent attention to eliminating the constraints that the poor face in accessing productive resources, knowledge, finance, durable infrastructure, and markets. And this is how the CGR is addressing this through its integrated uh, approach. Action number two, we need to co-develop with smallholders packages that can consist of technologies, policies, market arrangements, and access to services. This will involve integrated, innovative, and comprehensive approaches that cut across the entire food system and are targeted to smallholder producers and that address their specific needs. To conclude, I'll give you a very quick example. By integrating crop breeding programs with market strategies and nutrition education for farmers and consumers, rural families have incorporated biofortified vitamin A rich sweet potato into their diets to improve nutrition and health. So far, CGI has reached 6.2 million households across 17 countries in Sub Saharan Africa with improved varieties of sweet potato. This is just a small example of how the CGR continues to deliver uh, from its 50 years experience in order to tackle the, the, the challenges that we have in the 21st century. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kanayo, and thank you for those wise thoughts to drive us towards the summit and, and beyond. Now we will listen to Jemima and Joki. I guess that no one is better than her to come and gender issues. Jemima is the coordinator of the Growth and Economic Opportunities for Women program at Canada's International Development Research Center, IDRC, and will join IFPRI as director for Africa next month. She has previously worked at CARE USA and in several CG centers. The leading voice and has published widely on gender and women's empowerment in Africa and globally. Jemima, reducing social inequalities within changing food, land and water systems is a priority for CGR. How can CGR play a more transformative role in global efforts to close the gender gaps in access to resources, information, and power for women in agriculture, please. 
Thank you very much, Patrick, and, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this conversation and to talk about gender and social inclusion in the CGIR research agenda. Um, first, let me say that um, the CGIR is a, at a pivotal moment to transform the way we look at gender research and social inclusion in genetic, in land and water systems and, and food systems. And it's been very gratifying actually to see uh, when Claudia presented that gender equality and social inclusion is one of the impact areas and, and therefore remains a critical part of the, of the research agenda. Um, I will start with talking about some of the things we know and, and from there make some propositions about um, where I see us moving forward uh, within this new research agenda. Um, so first, we know that securing sustainable food system hinges on gender equality. I think that is not um, uh, in debate anymore, that a sustainable and inclusive global food system is only possible if women, if young people, if indigenous people everywhere are empowered and their rights are recognized and, and, and respected. But we know there have also been a lot of ch challenges because these groups of people have often lacked access to productive resources, to agricultural inputs, to information, to finance, to markets and social protection, as well as technological and entrepreneurial um, know-how. And for women, this has actually been a huge challenge because in addition to this, they are also primary caretakers in their households facing very heavy workloads that can sometimes undermine their productive capacity and overall uh, well-being. And with the COVID pandemic, we've only seen this um, exacerbate. And in addition to that, we know there are harmful social norms and stereotypes on, on what women can or should do, what young people can own, cannot own. And these continue to persist in many parts of the world. Now, the, the good news is we also know from previous research that when women, when young people have better access to resources, to services, to economic opportunities, to decision making when they are part of the decision making processes, that communities have more food, their nutrition status improves, rural incomes improve, food systems become more efficient and become more sustainable. And that's why uh, gender and social inclusion is not just a research agenda by itself, but gets uh, integrated in other um, outcomes. So we've made a lot of progress on agriculture, on food systems and, and gender equality. And the CGIR has been a huge part of this progress. But moving forward, we, I see a need for a radical change um, in the way we approach gender equality and social inclusion, and one that the one CGIR must take a leadership role in. And so I have three propositions um, for this um, streamlined one CGIR system. And the first one is we need to stop trying to fix women and to fix young people. There's no problem with women or young people. And we need to start focusing on fixing the systems that cause inequality. In a sense, we need to move away from what we've traditionally focused on in terms of closing gender gaps, um, in terms of documenting what women's roles, what the roles of young people are. In the, whether it's in the genetic systems, in land and water systems, or in food systems, to thinking about how these systems can be designed and transformed in ways that contribute to their empowerment, uh, not just the empowerment of women, but youth and other groups. Within the research system, we really must move away from just using gender as an empirical category in comparative analysis of men and women's experiences to identifying and addressing the underlying causes of these gender differences and paying attention, especially to the way gender inequality becomes institutionalized in our systems, in norms, in organizations, and in rules of distribution. A quick example, if you think about access to finance for women, 
it is not enough to just get groups of women or young people and train them on financial skills without working with financial institutions to actually change the ways in which they design their products, the ways in which they market these to women, and the ways in which they perceive women in agriculture and in food, um, in food businesses. And I'm very happy that part of the IDRC support to the CGIR uh, gender platform is to kickstart this new era of research that focuses on um, fixing our systems so that they are more equal. The second point I would like to make, the second proposition, as somebody who has worked previously in the CGIR for many years, is that the system must value and resource the scientists and the researchers that are working on gender equality. They should not remain in the margins of, of, of research leadership or of resource allocation. And I can say that providing the necessary resources to gender researchers is going to be a strong indicator of the commitment of the one CGIR to gender equality and social inclusion. It is not enough to just say it is important. We must put the resources um, uh, where our mouths are. And the final point I want to make is the importance of embedding gender equality and social inclusion, especially in national agriculture programs and national statistical systems, because what gets measured actually gets done. And we've seen at country level that gender equality and social inclusion has remained mainly within ministries of gender and family welfare and not got um, integrated uh, well in, in, in agriculture. So a program that engages ministries of agriculture and national statistical systems would ensure that national food systems are designed and that they transform in ways that are socially um, inclusive and are equitable. And I know that this is easier said uh, than done, that while well, these national partnerships are usually much more harder than international collaborations, they really are imperative if we want to build food systems that leave no one behind. Um, I'll, Patrick, I'll close by reiterating that securing sustainable global food systems is only possible, only possible if women, youth, indigenous people everywhere are empowered and their rights are recognized and respected. And I believe that the CGIR is at a pivotal moment to lead the way in enabling this and in um, helping us understand uh, what works. All I would say is do not let, let this opportunity get away. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Jemima. As I thought about you provoke and we will continue with strong provocation with uh, Laurent Pedat. Uh, no one better position than himself to comment on consumption and nutrition issues. Laurent is the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition Gain since 2016. He was awarded the World Food Prize in 2018 after being the director of the Food Consumption and Nutrition Division at IFPRI from 1994 to 2004 and Director of the Institute, Institute for Development Studies in UK from 2004 to 2014. He was the founding co-chair and lead author of the Global Nutrition Report from 2014 to 2016. And he served on the steering committee of the high-level panel of experts of the UN Committee on World Food Security. Lawrence, CGR research on agriculture has played a role in improving nutrition globally. For example, through supply of biofortified foods. For the next decade, as Claudia has outlined, the plan is step up from technology research to real efforts towards system change. But what would CGR and similar research bodies need to do differently to become a meaningful part of system change when it comes to nutrition. Please. Thank you, Patrick, and, and thank you, colleagues, for organizing this session and for inviting me.
to participate. I really uh, have really enjoyed the previous uh, presentations. Thank you. So, so Patrick, you know, your question to me is what should the CG do, do differently to uh, increase its impact on nutrition? And uh, to me, that, that means uh, the CG should focus on really big questions. What's the clarion call for the CG? So for me, one really big clarion call is the fact that the SOFI report from two months ago said Astonishingly, 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. You know, to me, that's completely outrageous and um, you know, that's something we have to overturn. 1 billion of those 3 billion people uh, live in Africa. Three quarters of Africans cannot afford a healthy diet. And the price of nutri nutritious foods uh, is increasing. I'm talking about foods that, that are essential to add to staple foods for the consumption of a healthy diet. It's things like pulses, vegetables, fruits, eggs, dairy, nuts, fish. These kinds of foods are absolutely essential because they're so rich in, in nutrients, uh, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, high quality proteins. They really matter to prevent undernutrition, the kind of kids we see that are skin and bone, and the, the more um, invisible forms of malnutrition like stunting, kids that are too short for their age and they have um, impaired cognitive abilities and functions, but also for um, things that we're seeing exploding in Africa, Asia and elsewhere, uh, things like overweight, obesity, diabetes type 2 and hypertension. How can the CGI help tackle that 3 billion healthy diet? situation. Well, I think there are three domains where the CG is doing too little research. Um, let, me, let me rephrase that. Three domains where there is too little research and where the CG is well equipped to fill that gap. So the first one is around policy, the policy environment. You might think that's, that's strange for me to say. I used to work at IFPRI. IFPRI is one of the leading policy research institutes in the world, if not the leading institute in food. And of course, the rest of the CG has some very excellent uh, policy research units throughout it. Because policy research that tends to be done it tends to be um, very bite-sized and atomized. And that's partly because researchers, uh, it's easier for researchers to grasp smaller questions, and it's partly because it's easier for research funders to fund smaller questions. But the one CG has to lift itself up and look at the big picture. So, for example, let's look at the portfolio of agricultural research and development. And this is a, this is a policy issue. It's not an investment issue. It's a, it's a policy issue. The agricultural research and development portfolio, if you split it down by crop and by food, and Patrick, you talked about 20th century. That portfolio is very 20th century. It's firmly rooted in uh, staple crops, uh, that was really, really important, and it still is um, when it comes to averting hunger. The thing that's really exploding is, is the malnutrition due to the lack of access to nutritious foods. And that means more of the, more of the research envelope being spent on the kinds of foods I mentioned earlier. Pulses, um, fish, eggs, dairy, um, fruits, vegetables. The productivity of these foods is, is flatlining and in some cases, like pulses, declining. The second policy area that's really important is um, public procurement. Governments are the largest uh, purchasers of food. They purchase food for schools, for hospitals, for the penal system, for a whole range of institutional um, purposes. But very often governments don't, uh, they don't talk the walk. They say one thing, yes, nutritious food is really important. Yes, we need to increase its access for the very poorest. And what do they do? They spend their, their money for schools on um, cheap calories because it's cheap. Um, but that's just that's just um, that's just a short-term solution. It's undermining the very the very fiber, the very basis of the human capital of the next generation. So, um, what's what's the what are the ways of re redesigning and re-engineering public procurement to send? a very strong signal to the private sector that we care about nutritious foods. Um, here's, here's a new platform for doing that. We need some research that shows governments here are the benefits of doing that, and here are some ways, ways of reducing the cost of doing that. That leads me on to my second area, which is the private sector. When I learned about um, when I learned about agricultural transformation, it was in the 80s. When I first learned about it, it was in the 80s. 
And the model was we raise on farm productivity, that generates demand for the non farm rural economy. If the non farm rural economy grows, and there's a feedback loop to farmers. Uh, and that model, I think, was highly appropriate for the 80s and maybe even the 90s, but it's no longer the dominant model because. The, the gap between where food is produced and where food is consumed has become much longer. Supply chains, value chains have expanded. The distance between farm and fork temporally has increased and spatially has increased. And what's filled the gap? Businesses, mostly small and medium enterprises. The decisions that small and medium enterprises make on the, and their impact on the availability, accessibility, affordability, and desirability of nutritious foods is huge. And incidentally, Jemima, as Jemima has said, the gender asymmetries within uh, the small and medium enterprise system, we don't know nearly as much about them as we do about the asymmetries uh, on, on farm and in the home. So this is a whole black box area that the CGR and its partners need to get into if you really want to attack that clarion call question of how do we make healthy diets more available to low-income consumers. I think the third area I'd like to see a lot more work in is the synergies and the trade-offs. And I think, um, I think, I think um, Nakao said very, said very early on, um, and I think that Jemima reinforced this, and you, Patrick, these, these goals that we're talking about um, the Claudia, so these goals that we're talking about are non-divisible. They're inseparable. Just like, just like we think about human rights, political, civil, economic, social, cultural. We don't. We don't. We can't choose, choose which of those rights we protect, respect, or facilitate. It's the same thing. So well, it's health, climate, climate biodiversity, livelihoods. livelihoods. We don't. We don't want to have to pick and choose. If you're, not, if you're not going to pick and choose, you have to understand what the synergies are, and you have to understand what the trade-offs are. Pick an example, animal source food, highly, highly politicized question. A lot of consumers in the north saying, saying eat less animal source foods. A lot of, a lot of um, politicians and consumers in the south saying, what do you mean eat less animal source foods? I don't eat any at the moment. I eat steak, steak or porridge. Uh, three, times three times a day, seven days a week, if I'm lucky. I want to eat some, some more animal sources in my diet. It's good for my kids. That is UNICEF's recommendation that the very young children need to eat more animal source foods. So it's a massive inequality issue. There's lots of trade offs. So if you're going to reduce the consumption of animal source foods in high income communities, that would be good for health. It would also be good for climate emissions. But if you're going to reduce, if you're going to increase animal source foods consumption, Low income context. That's also, that's also going to be good for health, and it's, and it's going to be uh, it won't be quite as bad as you think it will be for climate emissions because uh, animal production systems are incredibly inefficient in many low income contexts. In addition, in addition to all of that, there'll be implications for livelihoods. Uh, there'll be implications for obesity and for biodiversity. If you, look, if you look at the evidence on these kinds of trade-offs for animal source foods, or for plant-based consumption, most of, most of it comes from the high-income countries. There's hardly any of it coming from Afri Africa, Latin America, or Asia. Asia. So that's, so that's another area where we desperately need these answers. So to, so to answer this, Clarion Paul Patrick, and to answer this question, we really finish. We really need to all system. Demand, supply, supply and enabling environment. The audio slides are great, great because they show, they show that the food systems, systems are there, are supported by land and water systems, genetic, genetic laws. Great one CGI reinventing itself. It has to do this. It needs partners. Bain is very happy to play a role in the one game, one, one CGI transformation. Thank you, Patrick. Lawrence, I'm so sorry because your uh, the, the the quality of the sound was not that good, and uh, I think at the beginning it went quite all right, but it it became to be worse and worse. I tried to catch your attention, but I I, I, I could not. But, but we will have to be uh, guestness, especially. Uh, and apparently, we try to fix that from uh, the CGI office, but it, the, the, the sound, the problem, technical problem should come from your side. So we've got the beginning. 
I'm quite sure there, there was quite a lot of issues to share and we will, we do not have time now with the 15 minutes remaining to ask you again or, or for me to wrap up, but we will get sure that we get all your uh, suggestions on board. Well, I was looking at the chat and, and the chat was quite uh, active. And, uh, and the first, the, probably the, the main question that came up uh, from, from the audience was about uh, the, the way that the reform could make sure that the CGR center can become better integrated in pursuit of this exciting unified mission. Uh, if uh, I would leave it to Claudia just to uh, react to that, but feel, feel, please feel free, uh, Lawrence, Jemimi, and uh, and Kanayo also to add a brief comment on that. Claudia, please. Thank you, Patrick. Um, it's a it's a great question because it really builds on on the challenge, which is this recognition I think we all have about how interconnected the challenges are and how essential it is that we bring partnerships together into much more multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary work, both within the CG but also outward to to partnerships outside the CG. Now, in terms of the reforms and bringing together the centers much more effectively under one CG, there are really two avenues for this. The first is a change in governance structure, and this will be perhaps less important to external partners, um, but a significant governance, governance reform is ongoing to provide a, a much more cohesive vision for where the CG uh, needs to uh, contribute and and uh, how to bring together with our internal systems how to lower the transaction costs make it that much simpler for all of the different elements and strengths of the system to work together so on the governance side on the organizational structure side in terms of our policies and procedures all of that is changing hopefully that will be invisible uh, to all of you or simply make it that much uh, less complicated to partner with us Importantly, though, and it, and it uh, builds on a lot of what we've been hearing in this discussion, it's the way in which we're going to be designing our programming. So the intention is to have a smaller number of larger initiatives in the CG, and these initiatives will be much more demand-driven, they'll be much more problem-focused, they'll be designed from the outset to look at these five impact areas that we were speaking about. And if you ask your questions that way, if you structure your, uh, your research agenda in that way, it will pull strengths from across all centers to work together. So it was very interesting really listening, for example, to both Jemima and Lawrence talking about how important it is that we do more work in policy. On the gender side, we don't simply want to see more women working in institutions that are biased against women. We want to see the institutions transforming. And we can't expect the, the structure of food systems to change or the impact of food systems to change if the policies uh, remain unchanged, if the incentives for producing different foods and distributing different foods and pricing them differently and making them differently accessible, unless those policies change, we can't expect to see change in nutrition outcomes. So if we create our programming in a way that asks for every project or a very, every large initiative that we develop, what will you do in terms of nutrition? What will you do? You need that nutrition lens. You need that gender lens. Uh, the policy institutions will come in, as well as the institutions that work to produce the different uh, the, the, the different crops and, and work on those uh, on those agroecological systems, and it'll pull in from across the system uh, the integration that we that we really want to see. So the answer to how we will work better together really is twofold. We will be we are working to change our governance and our procedural and organizational systems to make uh, the one CG a much more integrated, impactful and influential whole. And we're going to be designing our programming and our research portfolio in a way that draws in all the interdisciplinary work that needs to be done from across the system 
wherever we need it. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, uh, thanks, Claudia. Do someone else want to comment on that, on the integration to pursue the general portfolio of the CGR and to address all challenges that you framed? Can I or Jemima or Lawrence, would you like to comment on that? No? Hello? Correction, Patrick. Oh, that's okay, Patrick. You can, you can take questions from the audience. Um, so we can at least attend to a few more questions. Can I? No, I was saying, Patrick, I think uh, Claudia's answer is, is quite comprehensive, and we could probably take other questions uh, from the chat or so from the audience so we can okay. at least address others. Okay. Uh, uh, so a question to Jemima. Uh, what the role what the role of youth and young people to address those uh, challenges of changing food land and water systems this is a question for the audience hello patrick i'm afraid it, it may be that jemima has dropped we may, uh, I, I okay. think we're having a technical difficulty with that. Okay, and, and who, who should be? Perhaps I can say a word on the issue of youth. Okay, if, if Jemima has dropped, please, Kanayo, can you tell us what you may expect from the UN Food Systems Summit? What it will deliver and how this uh, perspective is uh, is driving us uh, towards a, the best contribution that we can make to the summit. Oh, okay. uh, Patrick, thank you very much for asking me to comment on this question. Uh, fortunately, I had a session, I believe it was in uh, late August or so, so, with a uh, youth uh, group organized by the uh, one of the UN SDG2 uh, groups. And what I, what I said to, to the youth, frankly speaking, I will want to repeat it here because the question is often asked, what can the CGI do to, uh, uh, to help youth and to get them engaged in agriculture? Uh, the opportunities are there. And I've said, you know, youth, particularly in Africa, should not wait for opportunity to walk up to them because there's a lot of opportunity in the agricultural food system. And if we all understand when we talk about food systems, it's not just planting the seed or milking the cow, all, all along the value chain, huge opportunities, not to, not to talk about digital technology, which Claudia mentioned. So they have to be innovative. And they, they need to get outside of the, of the box. And I, in my own country, Nigeria, we do have quite a, a very exciting emergence of youth uh, businesses, organizations, you know, in a range of activities in the agricultural sector. And I think, and their voices must be heard. You know, the UNF Food, Food System Summit, the youth must get their voices heard, and not just on the sidelines. They have, they have to be engaged. And I believe the, the System Summit is addressing that. And when you say the, the setup of the, of, the, of, the, of the UN Food System Summit with the youth being engaged in various uh, groups, a champions group, you have youth, you know, either even as, as, as a co-chair co co one of the champions group. And this is my call. Uh, the CGI has a uh, in, in the number of, um, uh, Claudia gave us a, a staggering figure of the number of scientists, you know, researchers in, 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 this, in the CGI. And with a new structure that has been put in place, I see, you know, young scientists emerging and taking leadership in many many areas that we that we're dealing with, so the call from from my side is upon is on youth themselves to see how they, they can grab this tremendous opportunity that has been offered for their voices to be heard and for them to go after the opportunity and not to wait and expect the opportunities to walk up to them. Thank you. Well, uh, I thought that Jemima has come back. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, 
this uh, huge problem. Jemima, if you want to comment in 30 seconds about the role of youth in, uh, in order to undertake those shifts that we talked about very quickly. I thought, I think Jemima has dropped again. Uh, Lawrence, would you like to add a, a last comment on what we discussed just now? If the audience can, you can, can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you? Now, apparently, Lawrence, we cannot hear you. So um, um, I sincerely do, do apologize for this. I guess COVID has at least learned something to us that answered the major issue. This, this has come with the, with the sound even today just to demonstrate. I'm quite sure we will have quite a lot of further opportunities to take Lauren Jemima wise messages on board since we just embarked on the, on the reform. And uh, this, if you allow it, uh, and the, 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 the takeaway message that I, I would like to share with you uh, uh, based on this short discussion. Number one, it's time for change, it's time for the reform. I guess nobody has said the contrary, and on the contrary, from the chat, I saw quite a lot of excitement, and I feel very happy about that. Number two, there are many questions. Well, that is normal. A huge and profound change cannot take place without questions. And this will need consultation. This will need implementations. And that's the way we are looking at it. My third message is that uh, it looks like nobody has opposed a system-focused portfolio. And the fact that science is at the heart of transformation. Don't take me wrong, I'm not justifying this choice just because nobody has reacted. We are convinced quite a lot of comments on that in the chat. Number four, party partnership will be key to uh, really impact and design and not implement innovation. Science without innovation and impact cannot deliver what we are looking at. Number two, well, partnership also to celebrate the diversity and to design solutions that are specific to different, uh, uh, different contexts and building upon different pathways. Partnership as well to make sure that based upon a, a, a right-based approaches, we are looking at inclusion. Partnership also to ensure the target towards uh, women and young, looking at them as the problem, but as an incredible energy for transformation and the need to ensure that they are. And partnership, finally, to uh, cross different scales, to cross innovation at the local scales, policy at the macro scales and that's the way we can really look at uh, the of such a portfolio the number uh, five message is come through um, blending portfolio with partnership the, the reform is about that number six we still have quite a lot of known processes Designing metrics will be key. Number seven, we really need an intellectual and financial resource, mobilization and investment. Number eight, probably, well, if the reform is going on, this could be a catalytic role for transforming food system, but also for the whole and global agricultural research be agricultural research for development, which should build upon its specificities. And finally, I guess it's number nine, rendezvous at the summit with uh, a new portfolio, with reform ambition based on this discussion 
and on the messages we'll all share together from now to the summit. Thanks so much and once again all our apologies for the problems about uh, sound during this first chat. Thank you.